Hi again, I'm Joe Connolly from WCBS News Radio. Producer Neil A. Caruso and I will introduce you here to John Leland, the Chief Strategy Officer at Kickstarter, a company near and dear to many business owners and startup operators. Kickstarter is now doing an experiment that is being followed by small and large companies around the world. Kickstarter has gone, as I understand it, to a four-day work week. John, what are you doing and how is it going? Thank you, Joe. Um, so the four-day work week, uh, it's first important to explain what we mean by a four-day work week because there's a lot of different definitions uh, that go around. And what we mean by it is moving from a traditional five-day, 40-hour work week as our sort of standard work week to four days and 32 hours. So we are actually reducing the number of hours that we're expecting employees to work. Are you reducing um, pay? No, with no reduction in pay or benefits. So far, at least the employees are with you. <laughs> for the business owners, <laughs> uh, how, it, yes. how, how is it working out for the company? Yeah, so we're about halfway through the trial. And you know, part of our expectation here is that we actually would not see any reduction in uh, overall productivity or output of the organization. What that means is we did not change or reduce our sort of expectations, our goal setting for the company. We uh, didn't alter it to account for the fact that we would be working fewer hours. We just kept the same level of output of execution um, while making this reduction, which I know sounds counterintuitive potentially, but there's so much opportunity to reduce the number of hours for um, employees and the business while maintaining overall work productivity. Um, and so far, that's what we've seen. Um, how, can that be? Has, how can that be? Well, there's a few things here. So one is that if you talk to any person that works in almost any job at any level, they will tell you all of the ways that their job is inefficient and makes them do things that actually don't matter. Yeah. Um, and so in order to move to a four day work week successfully, you have to really take everyone has to kind of come together and take a look at all of those things, identify them, and strip them out of a job and strip them out of the work that you do. So it really requires everyone to sort of focus, um, make their work more efficient. And people know how to do this. There's just never any real incentive um, or um, align moment of alignment to really make those changes within an organization. But another I'm wondering big... if the deal here yeah. might become at companies small to large that employees would get a four-day work week in one form or another in return for going back to the office in person more often. Any thought on that? I think that's very possible. We've transitioned to fully remote as a company. Um, we were primarily in person based in Brooklyn, um, but through the pandemic, we've realized that we can do our jobs just as effectively or more effectively fully remote. But that works for the kind of business that we are and the kind of talent we're looking to uh, attract and retain. And it opens us up to just being able to hire in more locations a bit more easily. It's very, I think it's very hard to do partial remote, partial in person. Uh, that's probably the worst of, of all worlds. And so and I think a lot of businesses are experiencing this now as they're trying to figure out a workforce that some people want to be in an office and some people want to remain remote. And they're really struggling to match those two things. For us, we thought it's better for us to go fully remote. So you have employees working a 32 hour week mm -hmm. <laughs> for over four days. Uh -huh. Fully remote. Yes. <laughs> you must trust People them. You do have to catch up to this. You do, have to, you right? do have to trust your employees. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. We do trust our employees. You know, but it is, I know it sounds, it sounds a little bit crazy, but, but so far it's working actually very, very well. And I think, again, we think about productivity as, organiza as organizations kind of, uh, very stupidly for the most part, right? Hours worked does not equate to productivity. I think any business leader knows that because you have some employees that work many hours that are not very good at their jobs that you should probably fire at a certain point or employees that work the same number of hours that are very good at their jobs. Productivity is not about hours worked. It is about a number of factors. And that includes focus, includes engagement, how rested are your employees, how, motiv how motivated are they in their jobs? 
But it's also not just about individual productivity. It is about organizational productivity. And organizational productivity is a factor of how aligned is your entire organization pulling in the same direction, as well as your ability to hire and retain employees. And the 40 work week for us has been an exercise that's allowed us to really improve all of those sort of dynamics in our business so that employees are more engaged. When they come to work, they are rested and more focused. They're all more motivated to get their work done faster because they are earning every week kind of earn both for ourselves and for our coworkers, the privilege of working a four day work week. It's something Before that isn't just- some questions I just want to yeah. ask. Please tell us what are the big time sucks that people are finding they can do without? Yes. So meetings are the number one killer of time, <laughs> I would say. So a lot of it's stripping away unnecessary meetings or making meetings more efficient. Um, and then after that, you sort of go team by team. A lot of this is really empowering middle managers or, or sort of team leaders and looking at the processes that they go through. And there's a lot of aspects of sort of documentation or just dumb processes that have gotten built up over time that people just continue to do that they know doesn't really matter and isn't useful. And so empowering teams to sort of take a look at various aspects of their work and the sort of middle managers really trusting them to sort of strip out that stuff. Neil. So John, I think what you're touching on here is something that Joe and I have been looking into for the past couple of years, which is better work-life balance. It's a real hot topic. And what we've seen now is companies really focusing on the hybrid model. Um, but you say that that may not be working to their benefit. Do you see companies bringing people back to the office full time or any of these, you know, hybrid work, remote work? Is that here to stay? Is that actually helping, you know, people not get burnt out? You know, I think the more flexibility employees have, uh, the, the easier it is to manage burnout. I will say that I don't know where we're going to land typically in this, but I, uh, having run a company now that before the pandemic was increasingly partial remote, it is very difficult to do hybrid. Um, I mean, maybe if everyone's in the office Tuesday, Wednesday, and then everyone's remote Thursday, Friday, Monday, or something like that, then, then that can work. But it's very difficult to do that sort of split uh, where some people are remote, some people are in person. Uh, and from a real estate perspective, because we had to look at this as well, it's just very expensive to uh, own or lease and run an office setting if you're not using it five days a week. I mean, we looked at the price, how much money we would have to spend per person, per workday, uh, that we would expect to be in the office if we reopened our office. And it just didn't make financial sense. Yeah. And that's a, you know, big, that's that big economic reason. Um, but, you know, work-life balance for families, for childcare, and all those things do play a role. We're going to shift gears and talk about your uh, business and where Kickstarter is today. Um, but I want to ask you about those startups that are investing using Kickstarter. Are they mainly remote? Are they hybrid? What are, what are, what is their business model? I mean, we serve such a wide variety of small businesses and independent creators that it's there's no standard and, and we don't survey them on their sort of work practices right. like that many of our creators are making physical products um, we, we sort of skew towards people that are manufacturing physical goods and so that is primarily in-person uh, work where they are you know they're literally in workshops in pennsylvania and massachusetts and ohio and they're building things joe and are people learning less remotely now, no matter how many days, from not being around other people, maybe more experienced at the office, from not learning by imitation and that type of thing? Yeah, this is a part that we're still trying to figure out. And I, th I think as we sort of emerge from the sort of total isolation and remove of the early pandemic years into something that you know, we're all spending more time with each other. Finding ways that we can come together is really important uh, for forming relationships. And we're looking at ways that we can create opportunities to just co-work together in a way that isn't a meeting, but just to be present with each other remotely 
um, while we co-work uh, is something that we're also experimenting with so that you can have some serendipity in conversation as you work. So if you, you can imagine as, as uh, four or five employees basically being on a Zoom call, but not necessarily talking to each other. It's not an agenda. You're just all sort of talking through, this is what I'm working on right now. And you can have that sort of spontaneous conversation as things come up. And will you measure this? How will you measure the impact on the business by revenues raised or projects run? Yeah. I mean, we, we've all, you don't really change the ways that you measure success as a business, right? We are, right. we're going to be measuring success as a business by, by sort of our core metrics as a company, which includes the amount of money raised by projects on the platform. But that's also highly impacted by things like the greater economic environment. Um, so a lot of it has to do with our ability to achieve our goals and objectives uh, every quarter. And again, we didn't change the scale or scope of our ambitions as a result of moving to a four-day work week. So seeing if we're executing just as well, uh, there are SLAs or, or KPIs associated with our ability to deliver service to our users uh, that we're going to continue to uh, meet. And then we're also looking at employees and are they more engaged? Are they actually getting, being able to take that time um, back? Are they less stressed? Are they more committed to staying at the company long-term uh, and looking at those factors as well? Neil? So let's talk about Kickstarter as a business, John. Um, yep. What types of businesses, is there a shift in those that are asking for funding and also those that are raising a significant amount over the last two years? Yeah, over the last two years, Kickstarter, like many um, sort of companies working in e-commerce, uh, saw a sort of large swell in the number, uh, in the amount of money raised uh, by companies on the platform, just because I think people were at home and bored, honestly. Yeah. And so people didn't have places to go. And so they're, they're, they're winding up on places like Kickstarter. Um, you know, the, the shifts that we've seen are uh, gaming in particular, and actually tabletop games has become just a massive part of the Kickstarter ecosystem, because I think people want to spend time with each other, um, also doing things in real life together. And tabletop board games are, are a great way of doing that. So we've seen that emerge as just a, a really massive part of our business, actually. I've heard of a lot of... Uh... Uh, craft beer companies and restaurants raising money from Kickstarter. That was some time ago. Is that still a large area? Still a large area. Um, it, I, it's probably somewhere about 5% of our business is in the food space, uh, but that's spread across uh, CPG goods, like consumer packaged goods, um, restaurants, food trucks, things like that. They tend to do one campaign and then, They've set themselves up and that's it. Whereas you have some other companies that do um, technology projects or consumer products or games, and they come back and they do one or two projects every year. But to an outsider, sometimes companies raise an amazing amount of money. And is it just mainly that the people funding the startups want access to it in the future because it grows? What is driving the amounts of some of this <laughs> revenue raising? Well, we had the biggest project we've ever had earlier this year, which was a $41.7 million campaign <laughs> for books. It was an author, Brandon Sanderson, uh, who uh, announced that he had written several books during the pandemic and wanted to release them to his fans. And, you know, we knew this this campaign was coming and, and Brandon's team knew it was coming, but no one knew that he was going to raise $41.7 million. Uh, that is an enormous amount for books. What and do all those funders get? They get the books. That's <laughs> so all they get free. That's it. Yeah. Uh, so to speak, uh, yeah. So they get the it's not, yeah, they're, they're helping fund the production of it because he has to go into manufacturing and he's he's doing it himself. Um, but what's driving that is, yes, they want the books themselves, but they, you know, he had built up a community of fans right. that were really invested in the stories he was telling and his success, and they wanted to see him be successful. So there's, 
there's a kind of combination of both a desire for the thing itself um, and a, a sort of fan component, whether that's a, you're a fan of a brand, of uh, a concept or uh, an author. Or a cause. That fandom yeah. drives a really impassioned support for these creators. Neil, one more? Yeah, so John, you know, not everyone's going to be able to raise $41 million, but let's say, you know, a young entrepreneur or someone that's starting a business for the first time, what advice would you give him or her to use your platform and, and to actually find um, good response, maybe test market or, or what have you? What, what advice would you give? Yeah, so, uh, you know, actually that, that does speak to sort of the core advice, which is to start building up a community of people that are interested in what you're doing and what your product is before you try to, to raise money through something like Kickstarter. Because Kickstarter will, you know, for the vast majority of creators, if they're going to be successful, they will see a, a big chunk of their funding come from people just discovering the project through Kickstarter. Um, the typical successful project sees somewhere between 25 and 35% of their funding driven by, by people that are just stumbling across um, the, the campaign through Kickstarter's own discovery uh, channels. That means the creator still has to drive through their own marketing efforts that other kind of 75, 65%. And to do that effectively, you do really want to have built up this sort of community of people that are invested in your product that want to see it succeed, that you've included in the process that you're not just selling to, but you're actually building into sort of the foundation of your business that are going to be sort of the evangelists that you can build a business on top of. And the best creators that build really sustainable, large-scale businesses off of Kickstarter build that community and then treat it really, really well. They realize that that is, that is their core. Uh, that's the core of their business. Well, thank you for your time on this. really was two separate interesting stories. <laughs> uh, just back to, uh, to wrap up on the uh, four-day week, mm -hmm. big companies, corporations around the world, I understand, are calling you to find out how this is going. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. So it occurs to me then, I have a business idea for you, John. Maybe <laughs> Kickstarter can start a new business in, in management consulting. Is that, <laughs> that's not out of the question, though, is it or not? That is out of the question. I think we have enough. We have enough work on our plate, and I am happy to talk to any business leaders that are that are interested in exploring this. Yeah. I'll just say one more more thing about it. Just particularly coming out of the technology space. First of all, we're seeing businesses of every in every kind of sector uh, starting to look at this because expectations around work have changed. And honestly, the five day, forty hour work week was instituted uh, at a time when. There is typically only one uh, member of the household, the, the father figure working in a job and mothers were at home taking care of the kids and doing housework. Now over the last, you know, basically a hundred years, women have entered the workforce. We have two parents that are working and all of that housework that used to be done while the man was off at work still has to get done. And so you, particularly I think for parents that are connected to their jobs all the time, technology that come home from work and still have to do all of these all of this house chores they the li life becomes basically working in a job doing chores taking care of kids getting some sleep and then like kind of getting back into work and it's it, that is burning people out and we that, have not updated the way that we work since like 1920 yeah and the the things that actually shape the way that we work have changed significantly. And so it actually makes sense for us to kind of take a look at this. And that's why this works, because people are otherwise burnt out in their jobs, tired and not very effective workers. So if you just give people back their time to get some rest and come back fully charged into their work every week, they do great work. And that's why there's such resistance. You put your finger right on it. That's why there's such resistance to going back to the office full time. Mm -hmm. And it hasn't changed. It's actually growing, surveys yes. are showing. Wow. And I don't think you're going to, I don't think businesses are going to be able to kind of smoke and mirrors their way out of this. But they also shouldn't. There's so much fear about changing the way that, that they work. And it's, it's surprising to me how much fear I see in business leaders around these sorts of issues. 
uh, it, we are a class of people who should be taking risk and comfortable with that <laughs> and looking at things much more honestly and practically. And yet a lot of the resistance to this comes from business suits who are just terrified that any change is going to disrupt their business and they will be held responsible for it. And I think that's... Thank you very much, John Leland. And it's nice to meet one of the faces behind <laughs> Kickstarter. Thank you very Thank you. much, John. Thank you so much for having me, Joe.